to the Barclay History Museum, we're glad to have the opportunity for our special uh, exhibit opening on quilts. And we've got a, a great speaker on that today. But uh, uh, we get with lots of good history and good information about the school quilts. So we're looking that. But before we get started, let me give a couple of uh, announcements for upcoming events. Our next um, big event will be next Saturday, a week from Saturday. I know everyone just remembers this. We're all still running, right? <laughs> Walk is good. Historic History Hustle 5K going on at Rose Lawn next week. We're going to do a fundraiser for both these units. And uh, you can sign up for that and raise some money. The pre registration early bird special rate is fired for something. So this is the registration. But if you have people that you know that want to run, that's a great way to support them again. And then on May 13th, we've got a real special evening uh, here at the museum. It's a Saturday evening. And I'm going to have Jordan give us a little rundown of that event. Uh, so it's going to be called Cocktails, a springtime evening. We went with the double pun, Cocktails, T-A-L-E-S, because you're learning about uh, a couple of our signature cocktails. So we're going to have uh, two stations that night. Uh, one station will learn about Kentucky bourbon and just various bourbons, but also the history of bourbons, what makes Kentucky mm. bourbon uh, something special, uh, and also the techniques that go into distilling bourbon. And at the end of that, you'll get a signature cocktail. And then there will be another station outside, which is kind of like a mini gardening workshop. So each of the drinks will have a, a very special garnish. So you'll actually plant the seeds for those garnishes, and you'll be able to take home a mini planter, as well as the recipes for the drinks. So whenever you go home and you grow the garnishes, you can use the recipe for the drinks and use the garnishes that you planted here at the event for, for that night. So, uh, there will be, uh, like I said, two signature cocktails that night, uh, as well as uh, some finger foods and desserts as well. So, uh, more information, you can check it out on our website. And those tickets are limited, so if you're interested in that, I encourage you to go check that out. We have sold a few of them for the year, I think, 30 people. I think, yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, so, those tickets uh, will go fast, so if you're interested in that, I encourage you to check it out. Yeah. Right at the front desk, right over here. <laughs> or over here. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and then our evening lecture in May, uh, May 25th, uh, I'm up from tonight, uh, Thursday, May 25th, we have Keith Bailey from the Yellow Indian National Museum and representative from the Creek Education as well. And mm. we're talking about the repatriation uh, efforts that are going on with the United States. So that'll be a real interesting uh, topic or lecture for us here. All right, well, without further ado, let's get started for tonight's uh, main event. Let me introduce our speaker, uh, Mia. Mia is originally from upstate New York, and she moved to Cartersville in 2016. She's a retired occupational therapist with a minor in art history. Mia began restoring antique quilts in 1980, shortly after her daughter was born, and created her first quilt in 1982. Throughout her career, she rep has represented and presented quilts at Sotheby's and Antiques Roadshow. I'll show you some good stories here. <laughs> She's been a speaker for a variety of quilting shows and clubs and is currently a member of four local quilting guilds, including the Ella Valley Quilt Guild. Mia recently won third place in the Heritage Craft Exhibits at the 2022 Roseland Annual Art Festival and will be returning this year to exhibit more of the quilts at her quilts. Please join me in welcoming Mia. Thank you. First of all, I, I'm a show and tell kind of girl, so if you could get a little closer, you could see what I'm going to show a little better if you wish. I have no problem with that and um, I'd enjoy hearing questions as they pop up in your head because if you're like me if you don't say it right away it's gone. So just throw your hand up and I'll entertain any questions you have. Um, I started quilting uh, through Cooperative Extension. Has anyone ever made a quilt in this room? Aha, uh -huh. okay good. Oh we have a few quilters. Good. Good, good, good. So I'm just going to give you a very brief history. Quilting started before Jesus was alive. So it's, it's not just an American thing. Uh, quilts were used under armor by the Persians, and it was meant as a way of insulating their body because the armor was cold. And so they recognized insulation was a good thing. So multiple layers were sewn together and hence the beginning of quilting. But it was used under armor. So it was warm and protective, which it still is today. 
But there are three things um, someone said to me, well, what makes quilts so special? And there, I, I kind of boiled it down to three things that I thought would make them special. One is they function, they're economical, and they're beautiful. So FEB, function, economy, and beauty. And a lot of the quilts that I'm going to show you are part of my collection. Some are for sale because I have a business and I repair and restore antique quilts. I help to appraise them. I am not a uh, certified appraiser, but because I price quilts, because I buy them and sell them, I have an idea of what the market is, and I can tell you what the value would be to replace such a quilt. Um, but a certified quilt appraiser, there are two here in Georgia, only two, and there's at least three in every other state. And those are the people you need if you have something that's super special, like what you're going to see tonight in the exhibit, you might want to have yours appraised for the paper that's required to get your monetary return should, God forbid, a fire happen. So under insurance policies, getting a certified appraisal is important. Okay, so what you're going to see tonight is a combination of three centuries of quilts that I have. I have some from the 19th century, the 20th century, and the 21st century. So we're still making quilts. It's a, it's a process and it is something that would have been known as a cottage industry for some, and some it just was functional. They used up every scrap that they had. Now the first quilts were made in Europe and Persia, as I said, but they became more and more beautiful. They were used as petticoats, and then eventually they were put on a bed. And those were called bed rugs back then. If you, if you do your research, you'll see that rugs, which is something that people know about in Bartow County, right, rugs, because of chenille. Ta-da! <laughs> Bedspread, new function, I hope it's beautiful. So it was a bedspread. It is now my outfit. <laughs> That's right. So that was a cottage industry here, which became your rug industry, did it not? OK, so I've come to enough lectures in this building to learn about your cottage industries. And quilting is just another one of them. But we're going to take it to a couple other levels. Um, Recently, I was in France, and while I was in France, I bought this piece of silk, it's upside down, made from silk in Lyon, France. Oh, it certainly is. Oh, somebody caught on. I was going to say there's some history to this. So here's a cottage industry that I just, I just got back from France two weeks ago. So when I, when I went to Lyon, I learned that the prince, or actually it was one of the kings of France, had in his mind, how am I going to bring industry to my community? I need to make my community wealthy. Well, the silk industry was coming through. Marco Polo had been through, and he brought stuff from the, from the east to the west. And he said, huh. Well, it's getting expensive doing that. How about if I got the caterpillars? I'll bring the caterpillars to town. And he said, male and female caterpillars, two, for each house in Lyon. Right? How smart is that? And what happened is they created their own silk, a cottage industry. I don't want to tell you what I paid for this because it was as much as one of my quilts. Anyway. I had to bring this back because it was a French cave art piece. Isn't it cool? A piece of silk, one little piece of silk, equal to my, well, you'll see. Anyway, so I thought I should bring it because it was a cottage industry. It was a cottage industry. It was a cottage industry. Money makes the world go round. And you're going to see some beautiful things that help. Anyway, one of the most significant quilts in your show is one that you don't own yet. When I say you, I mean the museum. It's on loan. 
It's probably the most magnificent crazy quilt I've ever seen, and I've been doing this 30 years, and I've been to many quilt museums, and I've been to many quilt shows, and I've never seen anything like that. And you will see it in there. It's on this wall facing you, and it's in half, so you have to look at the photograph to get the full input. But I have pieces of one that was going to be like that. So I bring them, and I'm going to pass these around because I'm a touchy-feely kind of person, and this is how it was made. So if you're lucky enough to go to auctions and you find unfinished pieces, this is what you do. Here, pass that one around, pass this one around. I'm going to get them all passed around. You have to bring, turn them. <laughs> And each one was made by a different person. This one was made by Ida. So some of them are signed. Now, and were they given instructions? <laughs> no instructions. I'm letting you all touch and feel something. That's over 100 years old. And it looks like it was made yesterday. Here, enjoy. So these are, quote, crazy quilts. This is what you're going to see. And that's the most magnificent one I've ever seen is the one that's in there, truly. It took my breath away. Sarah was nice enough to let me see it. I was like, oh, got to see this. OK, so each one of those are called a quilt square. That's how we start. What makes a quilt a quilt, not a bedspread? Well, generally, it's because there's three layers. There's a top. There's a middle we call batting, and there's a back. This would have been the batting. But because it's a crazy quilt, what they did is they took odd shapes. They already had a plan in mind, mind you. It's not, this was all planned out. A woman has to have math skills too. Lots of geometry. That's a dirty word in some, some locations. But then, they turn it, they iron it, they embroider on it, they baste it, and then each one has their own square. You'll notice that most likely she had a stash of fabric, and these fabrics were from wealthy women, the high economy women. They could afford velvets, they could afford satins, they could afford silk. So you've got a little bit of everything. This was not a poor girl who did this. That's, uh, there's some that are painted on. That's hand embroidered. Some are better than others. OK. Same period of time. We're going to talk about this just a minute. Oh, and here's another one. Oh, this one has. Yeah, this one is actually coming apart. It says, two is company, three is a crowd. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought that was so cute. All right. So this is the same vintage. These are, these are turn of the last century, like around 1890. These, this is all silk. That's the back. Now, do you see how some are tattered and some aren't? OK, let's talk about the economy again. Silk was one of those commodities that wasn't made here in the US, not during that period of time. So it had to be imported. Anything imported had tariff. And money was always labeled to that. However, they, what they did is they paid by weight. They would weigh the silk. And silk is light. So what they did is they dipped it in lead. And they call it weighted silk. And that's how they made their money. And of course, the weight didn't help the silk at all, did it? So those pieces that were weighted got deteriorated the, the most quickly. But that's how we know this is pre-revolutionary, period revolutionary. It was during the Industrial Revolution, not the Revolutionary War, but the Industrial Revolution when they were playing with different dyes and different mordants, and they were playing with this. And of course, they wanted to get paid, and they added a little, you know, like put your finger on the scale kind of thing. All right. Again, 
<laughs> function, economy, beauty. All right, so now you get the idea. Once you get a square, I'm showing you how it's put together. This is a square. You have those squares. This one is, this is just a piece of a log cabin. Just to show you how it was made, I'm going to pass this around as well. These are all cottons because that's how it's made. It's, it's this pattern is pieces of rect rectangles, right? This is long before Lincoln Logs, but yes. Well, Lincoln Logs were uh, created by Frank Lloyd Wright's son. You know that, right? You didn't know that? Oh, well, there you go. Lots of history today. You know, it's a darn shame if you don't learn something <laughs> every day. Okay, and we're going to talk about this blue in a minute. But these are cottons. You've taken, you've felt other ones. So I'm, I'm going to ask you to, this is the most, this is a common woman's quilt. The common woman. Me. You. I mean, I don't know what your bank account is, but I'm a common woman. Okay. Now, we got through that. Oh, good for you. The silk can last forever if it hadn't been weighted down. That silk, that's why I didn't mind spending over $100 for a piece of silk. I'm hoping I'm going to have this a very long time, and my granddaughter will have it a very long time. But, but this, the choice of it is that there are still silks that are two and 300 years old in the Orient that you see up on a wall um, that are, are fine. The silk, it's an organic material. Cotton's organic, linen's organic, wool is organic. You have the animal kingdom fabrics and you have the plant world fabrics, right? So they, we know those are gonna last. We don't know about polyester. We know it's been around since the 70s. It's okay, rayon is lasting pretty long. That came around the last turn of the century. Rayon was our way of trying to make silk without silk, right? Did you like that cotton? Isn't that sweet? Okay, so let's just talk about fabric in a minute. Fabric speaks to our lives in so many ways. This is called a prayer cloth. I never heard of this before. I just recently gave a talk in, in Hilton Head to a quilt guild there, and my sister who lives not far away in Beaufort, South Carolina, said, um, you, gotta, you gotta go to this thrift shop. They're helping cure cancer, and we're gonna help, and you're gonna buy stuff. So I did. I found this there, and it has, it's again the same idea. A group of women each took a piece of fabric, took it home, and dated it, signed it. Each one is a prayer to whomever it was given to. Dated 1940. And with that I say, please, if you're a quilter, my quilter's in here, do not leave a quilt unsigned and undated because you're now part of the world of history. And you need to document what's going on. And you only can do that if you sign and date. Please. Please do that. Yeah. Who just said, oh my goodness? Okay. This one or this one? Okay, so you, you heard about that. Okay. This is my very finest quilt that I own here. This quilt is from 1840. It's all hand done. And it is a queen size appliqued quilt. What makes a quilt applique? It's a French word. I'm, I'm all about French this, these days. I'm becoming a Francophile. Anyway, this is all 100% cotton. This was not the everyday woman. This was a seamstress who knew how to handle a needle. It's all hand quilted. It's magnificent. It's hand applique, which means one fabric is applied over another versus being pieced together. So this applique has a border, and 
Rebecca, if you don't mind. Okay. I'd like everyone to see this one because it's really, this is a, what I consider museum quality quilting. Okay. Now, if we can ha hold it up tight so everyone can see. There you go. Now, doesn't it look different like this? <laughs> and so, in 1971, the first time a museum just said, we're going to take that quilt, we're going to put it on the wall, it was at the Frick Museum in New York City, 1971, and it revolutionized the quilt world. It went from being $2,500, went from being $25 at an antique shop to $2,500 just by putting it on the wall. So, but you can appreciate the fact that this is a piece of art and that this is a skilled, a very skilled uh, needle crafter. It's all made by one person and this was made in New York. Yes, please. Now, I just want to talk about this is not, it is, it has an initial in a corner, D-O, but no date. Um, but I can tell you, this is important because this is the 1840s, and we're now in America. This is American-made cotton. This is American-made fabric and dyes. This dye was made with arsenic, hence it's called arsenic green. Have you ever seen wallpaper that they said had arsenic in it. In older homes, it's the same dye. They needed arsenic to apply that green. Now, thank you. The red is, yeah? You, you got it? <laughs> You're gonna do it for me? <laughs> the red is uh, called turkey red, not because it's made from a turkey, but it came from a dye that came from Turkey. Turkey the country. And that came from Madder, um, M-A-D-D-E-R. It's a plant, and they use the root. Anyway, there's a whole, there's a whole other lecture in dyeing. But we're going to talk about quilts. Now, so that's my 19th century quilt that I talked about. This is a 21st century quilt. This is made of men's ties, made to look like what you've been passed around, right? Do you see the squares? Okay, and these quilts are very difficult to quilt. Um, the reason I say that is because it becomes too um, hard for a needle to go up and down through because, yeah, we can hold this up. So instead of taking a needle and sewing it through to quilt it, we're going to turn this around in a minute, they tied it. So that's called a tied quilt. Okay. <laughs> and that does not require needle stitching and great care. However, this was all made for uh, American Legion Hall. So I'm, I'm probably never going to sell this, but this was all men's ties that were from, they were veterans, and that's near and dear. Okay. Now, speaking of which, Women didn't get the vote in this country until when? 1920. Very good. Very good. This quilt comes from 1920. And it's a way women secretly let you know we want the vote. It's white for women, W. It's V, violet, for vote. And G for green. Hello, women. Go vote. And this is what we would call, it's a form of propaganda, I guess you could say. But it was a way a woman could express herself politically. And this quilt does that. Go. Green. Violet. Vote. Women. White. Women. Go vote. This is appliqued hand quilted. Yep. The, um, it's, as you can see, it, we call this a scallop border, also known as, as an ice cream cone. It has other names, but it's, it's 
got that. And then you have the applique, and this is buttonhole applique. Um, that's hand applique, like a buttonhole, over and over and over. She wanted you to see her applique. She didn't hide it like my other quilt. So she wanted you to see this. It was in your face. Go vote. Now, here's another one that's politically involved. Remember a president whose name started with H? Hoover. <laughs> Evidently, she didn't like him much. She never finished it. There. <laughs> And that leads me to tell you about the Depression, Herbert Hoover. Okay, so during the Depression, fabrics were extremely difficult to, to come by. And not only that, um, their function uh, was always there. We always needed warmth in our beds and we needed all kinds of things. We needed, in those days, uh, I wasn't alive during it, but my mother sure was. And she talked about it, and she was a child of the Depression, and they held on to everything. They never parted with anything. And that leads me to this quilt. <laughs> and then I'm going to talk about another quilt. So this is the 20th century. This is 1920s. And this is a, another, um, a bunch of people got together. This is a sampler, meaning that each square is a different pattern. It is a sample of patterns. By the way, that's not a swastika. 1920, and they didn't call it that. Anyway, these are all different quilt squares, and I could go on and on, but quilt squares have changed names depending on locality. And I'm gonna show you one um, that, that's the very next one. But this is one that I have not yet repaired. So I wanted you to see it in the condition I found it. This is called a summer weight quilt. What she did is she just put a flannel piece as her batting. She had nothing. She had no money for batting. Every one of these pieces has been somewhere else. There's shirting in here, somebody's shirt, someone's pajamas, a piece of a curtain. This is what I call a, a typical depression period quilt. But you get the feel, right? You get the feel for it. Sure, go ahead. Let's see, this one? That's the basket, yeah. And I have a whole other quilt I'm going to show. It is a basket, yep. This is, yeah, and it's there too. And then there's crown of thorns is here. There's many, many. Um, different patterns. There's bear, bear's paw. Wait a minute. This is a bear paw. This is a basket of plenty, which I have a whole quilt of, or a fruit basket. Um, yeah. Um, but as I said, they change names depending on where you are. This is the bow tie. And this is just on point. This? This one? With the points? Oh, this one. You know, not always do I remember, but this could be crossing T's. It could be a variation of crossing T's. You know crossing T's? I think that's a variation of crossing T's were, oh, that was, why did they have crossing T's? Temperance. <laughs> I mean, everything had a meaning. And a, so, yeah. So it could have been, and again, this, Right? Like the chenilles. Okay, so this one has many, many names. It's been called Suspension Bridge. Isn't this cool? I just love the, um, Joe, can you help me with this? This is my partner in life. This is Joe. Without him, I couldn't do any of this. So this is also known as New York Beauty, but it's Suspension Bridge. Ken Burns, the very famous historian and documentary, this is his favorite quilt. Um, he's a quilt collector. He's a historian and a quilt collector. This is his favorite pattern. Is this, one this is all hand done. Oh, by the way, see the quilting? It looks like a fan. It's called the Baptist fan. <laughs> right, 
That's what it's called. This was probably a red. This, it's called a fugitive color. It's now become a salmon color through time. Again, same period. This is around 1900, 1910, this, this quilt. Um, and it's heavy. It's heavy. She used, yeah, well, that was the mouse that did that. Yeah. Sometimes you find quilts, in, in, and I just use them now as part of my lecture. I can't sell these. So, but I think a little bit of both. A little bit of both. Okay, so this is a Georgia quilt, which I just acquired. I bought this between Adairsville and Cartersville in an antique shop. You were with me, my dear friend, Connie. And I hesitated and hesitated, and the next day I went back and bought it. <laughs> okay, so this is a Victory Quilt, 1943. Now, who notices the V? You see the V? What do you see next to the V? Dot, 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 dash. Morse code for V. How about that? So in 1943, I'm sorry. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> I didn't even count, but you got a good question. Uh, let's see the white stars. One, two, three, four, five, six, and six. Yeah, there's probably six over there. That's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So it's just that it fit there. Um, but it has the bell, it has the eagle, it has the stars and stripes, and it has all hand quilting. I didn't measure. I didn't do it. I did not. You can count. Do you see the V in the, in the quilting as well? These are all Vs. Is that stitched in? Yes, it's trapuntoed. She's, she's stuffed it. That's got... Yeah, that's right. That technique is called trapunto. Trapunto. It's a, it's other cotton stuffing, just, just cotton. Yeah, I'm going to turn this around so you can see. Joe, come around the other side. Just see how it's all hand done. But this is a Georgia quilt that I bought. Now, this woman saw this in a magazine. She ordered the pattern. This is how I can find the documentation because it's in a magazine. And so we know that this quilt has been made by others. In those days, that's how women communicated. They shared. They didn't have magazines like today we have magazines and they're all online. But they have Ladies Home Journal or Harper's Bazaar and you would see these things. This is Amish. This is... This is from um, Ohio, thank you. And you have one of these in the show, very similar to this. It's called Broken Star, and you could see why. Now this is Amish, 1930s and 40s. How do I know it's Amish? Anybody? Well, the Amish did not use calico. They only used solid fabrics. Did you know that? Okay. And they would not use electric sewing machines. They would use a treadle, but they wouldn't use electric. This is all hand done, however, every little bit of it. So I thought this was pretty special. I've... Well, you know, that's the Amish. They're a little anal. Oh, don't, don't tell them I said that. Oh, that's on my, delete, delete. <laughs> Precise. Thank you, Ian. We're all friends here. <laughs> okay, so um, this one I am actually selling for somebody else. This is again like the crazy quilt. This is not made by a poor woman, and we're going to show you this is all velvet. Turn around, and it's all satin on the other side. Not cheap, right? So this was a wealthy woman. This was not ever to be used. It was a showpiece. It probably hung on the back of a chair. And sometimes they would put them on the piano. They would drape these on the piano. Very Victorian. 
so you know the period of time. Victoria lived a very long time, but definitely 19th century. Quilt kits. Anybody play with a quilt kit? No? Do you know of what I'm talking about? You could order uh, on the magazine a whole quilt. It would come in a package in the mail. And it would be the fabric, the threads, the needles, the patterns, everything. Just go for it. And that was what this is. And this was Mountain Mist. That was the name of the company. And if you're lucky enough to find one like this, they're in pristine condition. But this is all, this is hand applique as well. But this was a kit. Yeah, yellow irises. Also known as flags. Thank you. That there's a color in here which gives away the, the year of this because these are solids. But I also know it was this particular thing. This was 1940s. Thanks, hon. And I'm not going to do that right away. Let's wait on that. Okay, so industry. Again, industry. This color. Anybody know what that color is called? Besides blue? Indigo blue. That's something that grew around here and was the whole economy, kind of like the silk in Lyon. This was indigo from South Carolina, right? A whole industry, 50 years of wealth went to South Carolina because of that little blue dye. Just saying. Money. This is one that I found as a top like the other, and I quilted this. So I'm showing off my quilt. These are those little triangles. I heard someone say that their grandmother Always made quilts with triangles. This is all triangles. Thank you. So, this is the top. Yeah, I, I only hand. I only hand quilt. Um, this top was from 1870. I put it together three years ago. It is not an 1870s quilt anymore. Let's talk about that a minute because once you change this quilt, it's no longer an 1870 quilt top, it's now a 2020 quilt because I finished it then. So it, it behooves us as historians to write on the back, and I haven't done it yet to this quilt, to say that quilt came from Ithaca, New York, which is where Cornell University is, and I bought the top at an antique shop and said, I'm in love with this. I love the border. I love everything about it. I'm going to quilt it. And so I chose that pattern and I did the quilting. It's a, it's a play on a Celtic uh, tulip. Oh. <laughs> um, it took me over a year. But I didn't do it every day. And you know what? That's the thing about quilters. We have UFOs. A UFO is an unidentified, <laughs> or at this point, unfinished object. And they go in the closet. Because when you get, a, you get it in your head, I can't do this anymore. i got to stop. And you go on to the next project. And you do that for a little bit. And then you can go back to that project. And so I wind up buying people's UFOs because they're in the closet. And I was like, I like you coming out of the closet. Come on, come to my house, I'll finish you. And that's what I do. I don't really start quilts unless they're for my family. And they picked out the fabric and they know what they want because you can't please everyone. And I'd rather take somebody's unfinished work, which I'm gonna show you, and finish it. So I have two right now that I sent to a quilter. This quilter has what's called a long arm sewing machine. That's the 21st century way of quilting. So I'm just going to show you. Let's look at the back first. This is all done on a machine. Now, it's just like a jigsaw puzzle, right? It's meant to tie the front and the back. 
If this was of more historical significance, I would have hand quilted it. Uh, yeah, you're going to see. <laughs> the, yeah, this is a quilt from the Depression. This quilt was made using fabrics that were found. And in this case, it's muslin and feed sacks. So I wanted you to see that because it's so delightfully bright and fun. And this is called Grandmother's Flower Garden. This, these are appliqued onto the muslin. Um, sometimes they're pieced in and it's, that would be a more significant quilt. And I would not have done it this way. But I wanted this finished because I know someone's going to love this quilt. It's happy. And that's what they needed during the Depression. So a thing of beauty, huh? So this one will uh, probably be for sale by September. I'll have this ready for the rose lawn in September. And this is the similar vintage depression period. How are we doing on time? Oh, we're good. This is called Dresden Plate. These are feed sacks too. Same maker. These were unfinished tops. So I thought you'd like to see that. What she did is she used black embroidery floss to do her applique. So it's again, it's, it's not buttonhole stitching applique, but it's just done like, a, like a, a running stitch. But again, I did the same thing. I took it to the long arm filter because Dresden plates are a dime a dozen. There are many, many, many of them. So it's not of historical significance. Had grandma made this, it might be different. And of course, that's the other thing. You can't put a value on what you've inherited. That's something, I mean, somebody has to appraise it, but I don't want to do that if it's somebody's family because I don't want them to be insulted. But that's not of historical significance. Hence, I took it to a long arm stitcher. Now, I seem to have an obsession with this pattern. This pattern is called Princess Feather. But what makes this so unique is the counterpane that's in between the sashing. Because she used Lemoyne Star in between. This is all machine appliqued. This is done on a treadle machine. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's what I see. Well, that's, that's hence the name, Princess Feather, because um, it was a European feather, actually um, more like Moroccan feather in the prince's hat. And so it's, for some reason, it's become the Princess Feather, but it was the Prince's Feather. And it has been since renamed princess, but it was prince. Okay. We talked a little bit about arsenic. Now I'm going to talk about chrome. This is another Amish top. This is log cabin. <laughs> See the log cabin now? So, and this is, this is, I'm going to have to hand do this. This is not going on a machine. And I don't like to hand do log cabins. They're a pain. But this one's going to require it. This is called Oxblood. And this is in its original colors. This is the colors they chose. Each color represented, um, and this is called chrome orange. It's also known as cheddar. Some people call it cheddar. But it was made with chrome. That was the mordant they used. Oxblood, green and blue. But I thought this was very interesting and striking. And very typical of the Amish, very dramatic. Okay, so we got quite a lot of those. Yes, gonna do that. Okay, this one is again, princess feather. So I have this thing going on with my head. This one, I paid a lot of money for this one. I bought this one outside of Philadelphia. And the woman was like 95 years old and she didn't want me to have it because she was afraid I was gonna ruin it. 
And I promised her, <laughs> I said, I won't quilt it if I'll ruin it. This is hand appliqued. You, and you cannot see those stitches. Notice the change here. This is what light happens to some of the dyes. This is, it was sitting in the light. Oh, sure. She wants to see the back. We're gonna do the other side. Now, notice. Flower sacks. This is bleaching company. That's what she used. Isn't that fabulous? So, I have not quilted it. <laughs> I'm afraid of quilting this one after what she said. She, she, she will, but look at this wonderful sashing, this fabulous, fabulous border with the tassels. So I use it for speeches like this. And I, I tell a story. Everything has a story. I don't. I have my own Christmas stuff that I've made, so that's what I show, yeah. Um, some of these, I think, would be great on a canvas, stretched in the right home. Quilts are, by the way, they're very popular again. You know, we've gone in and out of quilts like crazy. I found this in Florida in an antique shop for $12. I'll, I'll tell you that one. <laughs> okay, so what color do we have here? Cheddar, cr made of chrome. We have arsenic green. We have madder red, turkey red. Very popular, 19th century colors. The sashing is unusual. And I just love this. And for $12, I washed it myself by hand. That's the other thing. People ask me about the Kara quilts. But you're not all quilters. And usually when I speak to quilters and they want to know about washing, I go into like an hour lecture on how to take care of your quilts. Folding, unfolding, refolding, <laughs> airing them out, putting them on a table, putting them on a bed, not using them, preserving them, makes it very special. I'm entertaining questions at this point. Yes, Anne? Oh, yes, you did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or depending on it, it or right. Okay, so fabrics are made of, they are woven together. There's a weft and a weave. And, and depending on the thread count, people who buy sheets know about thread counts. Depending on the thread count, if it's not a very dense thread count, it's easier for a quilter to get a needle through, so she tends to like those, like muslins, because it's much easier on your hand to get the needle through. When you go through something that's a 300 thread count, the needle bounces back at you. It's so dense, it's hard to get that needle through. So the, the quality of the fabric probably was not there, and so it's it frayed. What to do with it now is I would applique over it with something comparable. So if it was a cotton made thing, I would applique over the one that's frayed and just hide your applique. Um, I'm sorry I didn't bring one because I've done that to some quilts. Um, the I No. So yes, so should you own quilts like the, these pieces? Yeah, I'm gonna ask for my pieces back. Um, I don't wash anything that's made of these fabrics, ever. Never goes in the water. What you can do is you get a screen, a clean screen, and you put the screen over it in a frame, and you vacuum gently to get the dust off. Or you just do this. Hit it from the back. I hand wash in a tub or a, a large sink. Never a metal sink. It has to be enameled. Okay, because <laughs> people have put it in copper sinks and uh, tin sinks and zinc sinks, and they, they go into that, yeah, goes into the fabric, and you may wash them. 
but wash them gently with a gentle detergent. Nothing, nothing strong, not Tide, none of those things. And should you have a, a stain that you're trying to get out, I use white vinegar, a toothbrush, and baking soda. Sometimes peroxide, if you think it's blood, hydrogen peroxide will lift it and then you can wipe it. Um, but support it from the back. Now, rinse it, rinse it, rinse it, three rinses. And then when you take it out of the tub, push it against the side to try to, you don't wring it out this way, you push it against the side, let it drip, drip, drip. Then you take towels and you wrap it in the towels to get it out of the tub. Because you don't want to, you don't want to mess with these tiny little threads that you've seen. When this gets wet, those threads won't last forever. And they get heavy and wet, or if you hold them like this, it's going to rip those threads apart. Never, never, never. So you go like this, gently, like this. I'm doing this, in, this as a miniature. And on a bright sunny day, not like today, you put down a white sheet on the, on the ground, on the, on the lawn, and you turn it upside down like this on the white sheet. Put another white sheet over it because you don't want birds to do what birds do, <laughs> right? And you let it air dry. Now the sun is good for that and it will air dry and once it feels like it's right, it's great. Then it, I've had quilts that, that I couldn't get past. I could not get it this far. So I had to, had to wash them. Because you'll hear quilt historians say, no, 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 don't wash, don't wash. I'm sorry. <laughs> there's, there's a point where you can't, there's no return. Yeah, you can't be in the same room with it. So yeah, that one that it was $12, that one, I washed that. That was awful. Okay, so it's five of eight. Any other questions? No questions? Okay, well you're gonna enjoy this show. It's fabulous. Thank you so much for coming out on such a lousy night. I appreciate it very much. Okay.